Okay, let's uh, turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. We'll be reading from verses 1 through 5. Second Timothy chapter 4. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, um, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of, of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Well, finally, we've made it to uh, chapter 4 and we have much to discuss. Uh, this last portion is a favorite for a pastor's conference when there's a gathering of believers, I mean, a gathering of leaders of the church, the elders, pastors, and there's a keynote speaker who is also a pastor, um, and he wants to exhort the pastors to stay faithful. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 is usually the passage that is spoken. And, you know, regardless of who the speaker might be, it's always... Um, you know, very convicting, inspiring. Um, but the word that I want to use today is that this text is a very solemn text. There's a solemnity uh, with regards to this. In fact, he begins by using that word, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. And those few introductory words are to cause someone to tremble and fear. But this is not just this is not just a command from Paul, like just preach the word. If when we look into the details of the opening verses, it's filled with terror. It's filled with with solemnity, this seriousness, this gravity. This, uh, this weightiness of this command, it's supposed to cause Timothy to start trembling in his, in his shoes, as it were, and realize that if he doesn't do what Paul has just said, it's going against God and against heaven, against everything. What is mentioned here is, is it's solemn. And we have to keep this in mind. These are the final words of someone who's going to die. He's in, he's in prison, he's about to be, um, um, uh, uh, to have his head uh, uh, chopped off, uh, and, and, and all the blood will be poured out. He makes sort of like a mention of that, I'm being poured out as a drink offering in verse 6. Um, the end is near, and, and he needs to say the most important thing. He, he doesn't want to waste words. And so he ends with this, tremendous, tremendous solemn warning to Timothy. And as you'll see, it applies, yes, directly to the elders of the church, but it also applies to everyone in the church as well. Everyone. And, and, and you'll see that as we go through this, this text. Sometimes problems occur in the church because the pastor realizes how solemn this verse is to him, but the rest of the people don't. Like, I think most of the problem and miscommunication between the pastor and the church can be solved if they saw how solemn it is to just preach the word in season and out of season. So let's jump in. Let's take a look at the outline. Um, so <clears throat> chapter 4 can be broken up into two main parts. Uh, the solemnity of the ministry, that's verses 1 through 8. And the second part, verses 9 to 22, we have Paul's dying request. Um, under the solemnity of the ministry, there are nine solemn mandates. And you'll see the verbs that we'll point out in, in a second, the imperatives. Nine imperatives, okay? Or nine solemn mandates. And then he gives three solemn reasons. Uh, here's a more specific outline. Um, under the solemnity of the ministry, the nine solemn mandates for the elders of the church, or 
the church itself is number one to preach the word to be ready to reprove rebuke exhort this is this is huge right here so you know what this is saying is that as a minister a bulk of his ministry while the priority is to preach the word to be ready to preach the word in season out of season a bulk of his ministry is to reprove rebuke and exhort the people of god he needs to do this and the people have to realize that's what a pastor is going to do he's going to reprove you he's going to rebuke you and then he's going to exhort you do you guys see do you guys understand why the church needs to hear the specifics of what is mandated so they will see, yo, well, he's just doing his job. That's what a pastor does. And notice, he doesn't mention anything about love your people. Be kind to the church members. Actually, the kindness will be here, exhort. Pericleo, to call alongside is to encourage. But it's like two negatives and just one what? One positive. Be sober is a command. Okay, it's a solemn mandate in their hardship evangelize here it is and then lastly be eager and there's three solemn reasons why all of those must be fulfilled it's because time is limited the course is also limited paul says i finished the race there's no more races to run it's just you have the you have the race given to you by god and thirdly okay uh, there are great eternal rewards as we will see this uh, hopefully uh, today if we have time now i'm not going to go into all of this but this is what we'll see uh, from verses 9 through 22. so let's jump into uh verse 1 the solemn ministry okay i solemnly charge you in the presence of god and of christ jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom now there's a lot here it's a it's a mouthful and again, and, and, and again, as I told you, if you understand this the way it ought to be understood, it, it's supposed to cause fear, a tremendous, tremendous eagerness to get it right. The first phrase, I solemnly charge, okay? Um, it's a Greek word, uh, uh, dia mar tu romai. Uh, it carries the idea of a forceful order or directive. Um, <clears throat> it's not like just a mere command okay it's very forceful okay uh it's a directive there's no choice you must do this and paul does mention this word uh, in other places in the new testament like in first timothy 5 21 he says it there i solemnly charge you in the presence of god and of christ Jesus and he here includes his angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. In chapter 6, he mentions it again in the first letter, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. And then in, in 2 Timothy, in chapter 2, he says it again, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them. So notice, Paul is solemnly charging Timothy, and then he's telling Timothy to solemnly charge the people of God as well. It's like saying none of us are off the hook. The elder is not the only one solemnly charged to do this. Do you understand? Everyone in the church must listen and heed and obey what God has given to us. What he's saying here is that it's a grave matter. For Timothy for all the church leaders, for the people who, who follow the leadership as well, all of us will stand before God and be judged. Now, you might ask, well, where's the tone of fear? Well, that obviously is a tone of fear because the charge is a severe charge. But notice he, he just adds on the fear by saying this, okay? Um, He compiles that, so that's the first one. And then he says, in the presence of God and of Christ. Now, this is very interesting. Okay. In the presence 
of God and of Christ. Um, now, when you read that in English, we, we think we understand what it means, meaning like, oh, it's just the presence of God. He's, you know, there watching, you know. We say things like, you know, be careful what you do in private because even though no one's watching, God is watching. The angels are watching. The demons are watching. But that's not the way <clears throat> this is to be understood. MacArthur tells us that the phrase in the presence of, in the Greek, has this idea of, of, a, of a Roman court calling you through their legal documents that you're going to now stand in the presence of the court and you'll be judged. Okay? Now, again, you don't get that in English, but that's the connotation. It's not that they can just see what's going on, like the omniscience of God. God just knows all things. He can see things. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. The idea here is, is, a, is this idea that you're going to be called into court. The, MacArthur says a typical summons might have begun like this. The case will be drawn up against you in the court of Hierapolis, in the presence of the Honorable Judge Festus, Chief Magistrate. Magistrate. So do you, do you see what's going on? It's not, hey, come to the court. We, we want to we have a party. Let's, you know, come. The judge wants to have a drink with you, you know, and just have a pleasant time. It's, 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 no, it's, it's a time where you realize I'm going to be confronted by something that is lacking or something that's, that I've been doing wrong. That's what Paul is getting at to Timothy. You will be in the presence of God and of Christ. They are going to judge you. It's not that they just see what you're doing. It's, the, it's in the context of judgment. Um, MacArthur also points out that the phrase in, in, that's, uh, that's translated into English, of Christ should be translated as even Christ. It's as if to say, God will judge and even Christ. As if to say, Christ is your Lord who died on the cross, who loves you, who saved you, who provides all things for you. He will strengthen you. But what he's saying here is, this is not the time where Christ will be kind. He will be strict. Even Christ. That's what he's saying. You must consider Christ as the one who, who will sternly judge your work of service in the body. This is not pleasant to hear. And this is the way Paul ends the letter in chapter 4 before he dies. And if you look at the next phrase, he is to judge the living and the dead. In the second part, the appearing in his kingdom, we'll get into that. But let's take a look at this phrase here. He's to judge... Christ will judge the living and the dead. Okay, what, what is this referring to? Well, um, I've listed here uh, that there are in the scripture uh, three times, uh, three times, three types of judgment. Okay, there are three types of judgment, and you have to know the distinction between all of them. One is the judgment of unbelievers, and this is called the Great White Throne Judgment. Uh, and it's found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And let's just take some time to read this because it's referring to uh, condemnation. Okay? There's no... Um, it's, for, it's for those who have sinned and those, those who are not saved. And then I saw a great white throne and him, referring to Christ, who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then... Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. 
okay? This is the judgment of unbelievers is eternal condemnation in the second death called the lake of fire, okay? Now, when Paul says Christ is judging the living and the dead, he's not referring to this. That's what I was trying to point out. So the other two judgments uh, deals with uh, believers. Now, this one has to do with the separation of believers from unbelievers or the sheep and the goats. It says right here, Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another. As the, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, He will put the sheep on the right, and the goats will be on the left, and these are the unbelievers. Okay? And the sheep on the right are the believers. Okay? So again, this is not what Paul is referring to. When Paul tells Timothy, Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, he's referring to the judgment of believers. Okay? Judgment of the believer. He's going to judge the quality of each man and woman. Okay? Each believer. Uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, so here's the first type of metal, or the first type of building material, and the other one is wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. Now this fire is not the fire of hell, it's just a fire to test the quality of that work which you have done before God. The fire itself will test the quality, the quality, not the quantity. Okay? The quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Now we'll look at that in a, in a few minutes. But notice, it's not about his salvation. He's not going to lose his salvation because of the, the, the bad quality of his work. Okay? It says here, he himself will be saved. Okay? He himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Okay? Right now, we just want to point out that in, sec in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when Paul tells Timothy... Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, this is what he's referring to. Uh, there's another verse, um, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. It says, we, now again, the we here is talking about the church, all believers, okay? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And by the way, this phrase, the judgment seat of Christ, in the, in the Greek, uh, it's the Bema seat. Okay? The Bema seat of judgment. That's how it's pronounced. And it's a seat that's different than the great white throne. Okay? This Bema seat has this idea of a, of a, of a, of a raised platform. Um, um, the MacArthur Systematic uh, the Theological Book says this. In both cases, the Greek word for judgment is Bema. In ancient times, a bema was, ra is a, was a race platform or a step used in athletic or political arenas. Rulers or judges would ascend the bema to render decisions in legal cases. Pilate judged Jesus from his bema seat in Matthew 27, 19. In athletic events, an authority figure would be elevated to a bema to judge the competition and award the winners, end quote. So this judgment seat is not the judgment seat that we saw with the great white throne where he condemns uh, unbelievers to eternal lake of fire. So he's saying here, all of us, okay, all, not just the elders, not just the deacons, every single one of us who are believers, we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done. And notice the two categories. It's good qualitatively or bad but this word here uh, should be translated as worthless okay it, it's not referring to sin okay it can't be he's not going to be judged for sinning because 
Christ died for all our sin. So the Greek word here is phalos, which means worthless. And the idea is that these are some of the works you've done for the Lord, but it was with bad motive, bad intention, bad um, 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 desires. It wasn't with a loving attitude, meaning you've done the work hourly, but because your heart was not right, it was considered worthless. It might have been to please men. It might have been to just gain glory from people. Whatever work you've done for the Lord is not good qualitatively. It's worthless. Because it's not sin. Okay? And notice, again, it's referring to believers. To make this clear, uh, where's my other verse here? Um, turn with me to Romans chapter 14, verse 10. I've got to write this verse down. Oh, here it is. Okay. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. It says, You, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt, for we shall all stand before the bema seed of what? Of God. Okay? And again, he's referring to a brother. Okay? He's meaning, don't judge the brother in the church because we'll all, we'll, we will all stand before God under his judgment when he sits on that raised platform to judge what we have done. Okay? Now, the question right now is, what does it mean... Um, when it says here, uh, uh, he will suffer loss. Okay, let's 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 look into that passage just for a moment. What does it mean when it says here that he will suffer loss? Because it sounds very very negative, and, and some people have said since in heaven there's no tears, no fear, no anything bad. Uh, this must not indicate uh, that there is uh, any kind of a shame. Well, it says right here that he will suffer loss. So we need to go through the text and to ask ourselves, what can it refer to? First of all, it cannot refer to punitive loss. Okay, the Christian is not under condemnation because of Romans 8, 1. Okay. Um, in Romans 8, 1, it says there is now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, we praise God for that. So when it says he will suffer loss, it's not talking about the loss of salvation. Okay, um, MacArthur thinks that it's a loss. Uh, the loss could refer to the realization and awareness of lost opportunities for Christ and a deep remorse for wasting valuable opportunities to bring God glory and to gain greater eternal reward okay like a momentary realization that you f you failed to do what's right all the time not that it's going to be in an eternally eternity long kind of a remorse but that brief moment of realizing you've cut a, you've could have done better with what god has given to you now you know you might be wondering well are we going to feel guilty up there well first corinthians chapter 1 verse 7 says so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also who shall also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, it's not, you know, that little, that loss, that sense of loss is we is what we believe a very like a momentary recognition, but after that the Lord will comfort you because He will draw you into His kingdom. And it says here, he'll keep you blameless uh, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the idea of shame, a momentary shame when you see him. It says in 1 John 2, 28, And now little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame. John is exhorting and, and admonishing the people to not be lazy, 
not just live their life thinking that all is well because Christ died for all my sin and you can do whatever you want. He's saying if you're saved, there should be this both love and fear mixture in your heart. A, a, a tension, you know, a delicate tension that's just always there. It's not just complete relaxation, a complete peace, a complete like nothing's going to go wrong. When Jesus comes, he'll come and, and it doesn't matter what I've done. It's, it's I know that he's died for me on the cross. I know all my sins are forgiven. But when he comes, I want him to smile at me and not look at me sternly and say these deeds were worthless. That there won't be any sense of shame in our hearts. Now you might ask, well, when is this going to happen? Well, we, but, you know, does the text indicate this, this phrase, you know, the living and the dead? And yes, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's going to, have, it's going to happen sometime right after the rapture, but before, uh, well, before the second coming of Christ. We will be raptured and we'll be with the Lord seven years in heaven and some. Somewhere in that timeline, we're going to be judged. Now, how do we know that? Well, if you take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and on, it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Now, this, the word sleep is a metaphor for death. Okay, those who have died. That you may not grieve <clears throat> as to the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep so these are the dead okay and then he's going to say for this we say to you by the word of the lord that we who are what alive okay here it is the living and the dead okay that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep for the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of god and the dead in christ will rise first then we who are what alive and remain shall be caught up this is the rapture together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air now if you take the if you keep this pass phrase in mind and you go to Zechariah, it talks about Christ coming down and touching uh, the Mount, Mount of Olivet, okay, where Jesus uh, was there praying, the Mount of Jerusalem. The text says here, he's going to stay in the air and we're going to meet him in the air. And so the, so the scriptures makes a distinction about the coming of Christ. One coming is he doesn't come all the way down. Okay, when he comes and touches his feet on the ground, that's his second coming. This is when he's coming and he stays in the air and we will meet the Lord in the air. We will go up to him and be with him for seven years. And thus we shall be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So when you go back to 2 Timothy and it says here, Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, we believe that this is what he's referring to, the rapture. Well, we have both those who have died in Christ or those who are Believing of God, believing and died, and those who are alive. When will he judge both the living and the dead? Right here. He's going to resurrect the dead and rapture all those who are alive, and then he will deal out his judgment from his bema seat. Let's go back to Second Timothy, uh, chapter four. So he says, "I solemnly." charge okay. it's a very strong order and if that wasn't strong enough he brings out a legal term in the presence of god even christ to say that it's like going to court you better have your life you know shipped uh shaped up okay uh, before you're standing before uh before god so it's, it's double fear. And then he says, who is to judge the living and the dead? And he's talking about the rapture. When the Lord comes, 
not officially a second coming because he's not going to touch the ground yet. But when he raptures us up, we will face him, not just us, but all those who also have what? Died. All of us will be brought together in, before his bima seat of judgment. And then if that wasn't enough, he says the appearing. Okay. He says, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Now we believe that this is referring to the 1,000 year reign, the millennial reign of God. Four reasons why it's so solemn. Because of the, the actual directive, because it's, it's legal, going to be judged as if we're in court. He's the judge of the living and the dead when we're raptured. We don't know when that's going to happen. It's going to happen at the blink of an eye. Anytime it can happen. And, and Paul's been preaching this, the rapture, so strongly that the Thessalonians thought it was going to happen within the next few years. Some of them actually stopped work, working and going to their day jobs. But Paul says to them, even if the Lord did come immediately, you should still be found working. So the, the idea here is imminency or just it can happen at any time. And fourthly, okay, how we live here will somehow affect what we will be doing in the 1,000 year reign when he appears in his glory and reigns over his kingdom on earth. You might ask, well, where do we get this uh, 1,000 year idea? Uh, we've gone through this several times, but every time we come here, you know, we don't want to take for granted that we believe in the 1,000 year reign. We need to read for ourselves what the scripture says. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, and he bound him for a thousand years. Now, some people think that he's already bound right now, but he has a long leash or something and he's going around the earth. That doesn't make sense. He's literally bound and he can't leave this prison cell for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and he shut it and he sealed it over him. Why? So that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received a mark upon their forehead and upon their hand, and they, shall, and they came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. We take this literally. Okay? There's no way to. There's no other way to take this. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. The dead, okay. Um, <clears throat> and if we take the timeline that the the tribulation occurs before this, those who died during the tribulation, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign. And notice, it just it keeps saying that. They will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from prison, will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. Now, focus on this phrase, a will reign. Okay, will reign. We see that again in 1 Corinthians. Uh, where's the passage? Okay, so uh, he who overcomes, I'll grant him to sit down on my throne. Um, Revelation 5.10, thou hast made them to be kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, referring to the church in Corinth. Now, this is amazing because the church was so bad. The people there were so immature. 
But Paul tells them, some of you are actually saved. And do you understand this? Okay. Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? He's saying, why are you suing one another in the law courts? You know, and if he didn't write verse 2, it would have been enough. He should have just said, it's not a Christian thing to take your brother to court before the unbelievers. You know, fulfill the, you know, get, resolve your issues uh, in the church. Let the elders get involved and, and, and resolve whatever it is you're fighting for. But look at his reasoning. The reason why we are not to go to court against our fellow believers in Christ is this. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And, you know, when you see the word saints, you're like, this is, it can't refer to the Corinthians. And then he says, if the world is judged by what? By you. He's looking forward to the day in the millennial kingdom that even some of these immature Corinthians have matured enough where the Lord is going to use them to judge the world. He's saying, if you're going to judge the world, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law court? Meaning, can you not use just, just some reason and level, uh, common sense, be level-headed, and just resolve this issue? And then he goes on, Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more the matters of this life? Okay, we're going to judge the world. We're going to judge angels. It's amazing to see what the Lord is going to do uh, with us and through us in that time. Now, I put this little, uh, I copied and pasted my uh, syllabus. Uh, my theology syllabus from my seminary days, just, just to show you the order of the events in case you're wondering, uh, because we don't have time to go into this uh, uh, today. But notice that the rapture and the resurrection is going to happen first. We read that passage in First, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. Um, Those who have died in this dispensation will be raised and taken, taken to heaven. So basically everyone who's died will be resurrected and brought there and then after that uh while while the tribulation is going to start okay the seven year tribulation will start the moment the rapture starts so all of this is concurrent in heaven while on earth the tribulation is starting does it make sense uh the judgment seat of christ it says here immediately following the rapture of the church the judgment seat of christ will take place in heaven it's called a bema seat. The judgment will evaluate the quality of the works of all the saints. Uh, those works that are good and acceptable to Christ will be rewarded. Those works that are worthless will result in the loss of reward. Whatever negative moment that you go through. And then you'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, this unites Christ uh, and the church forever. Then on earth, the tribulation will, uh, will begin. Um, and then at the end of the second tri uh, this, uh, seven years tribulation, we will have the second coming of Christ to earth. Uh, here, uh, um, he will judge the, the Gentiles. Uh, he will judge living Israel. Uh, the resurrection and rewarding of Old Testament saints and tribulation martyrs. The binding of Satan will occur here. And then the actual establishing of the Messianic kingdom. And then the mi millennial kingdom will will start. This is the 1,000 years uh, reign. Now, what's significant about this 1,000 years is not so much that we will be reigning with Christ. This is when every promise made by God to Israel will be fulfilled to them. And you need to understand when God makes a promise, He cannot break it. And it, and it hasn't been fulfilled in the Old Testament where Israel is given their land and all the enemies of Israel are submitting to them. Right now, there's chaos and war. But it will also be a time of righteousness, peace, joy, ecological renewal, unprecedented prosperity, long life, absence of disease, rapid increase of population, uh, vegetarian animals. 
Okay, there's some verses that refer to that. We don't have time to get into there. Uh, the kingdom will be made up of resurrected bodies and mortal bodies. We will have resurrected bodies, but the people who are alive during the tribulation will be transferred into the millennial kingdom, and they will have mortal bodies that will repopulate the earth. Okay, and then Satan will be released at the end, um, and there will be a, a war in the final judgment. And then after that, we head into this thing called the eternal state, where we will be with the Lord forever. There will be a new heaven and new earth, and another chapter into a life with, with God. Okay? So, going back to chapter 4, verse 1, okay, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. It's a solemn command. Now, we're going to go into the preach the word next week, but this is a time where we have to ask ourselves if we're taking our calling seriously. As a pastor, my job is to simply preach the word. Your job is to eagerly seek the word and then apply the word in the ministry, in the context of building up of the church of God. Um, church work whether it be a praise team or media team or usher or doing a, you know, becoming a deacon or helping out with things, going evangelizing or gatherings, everything pertaining to the life of the ministry is a solemn work. And there should be, yes, there's, a, there's an excitement. You know how we say, you know, God saving us is enough. But on top of that, he gives us a work to do. But because of his grace, we take his grace for granted as a license to sin. And we, we take the work of the church in such a, a blasphemous way. You know, we do it so lightly. You know, it's volunteer work, right? So I volunteered to come early today, but I volunteered to come late next week. With that attitude that it doesn't really matter. You know, and, and what's worse is that people tend to be more official in their work when the church is bigger. But when the church is small, it's like, hey, it's just our backyard, you know, we're just, you know, we know everyone. Why do we have to come exactly at this time and make everything so strict and orderly? We're not that big. No one's going to know. Guys, that kind of an attitude, the Lord sees. You know, if the church is bigger and you're more official because of that, don't you think that's a, a work that's worthless? He knows that you're doing it just because you see things and you think it's more official. You're not doing it for Christ. Because if you're serving Christ, it doesn't matter how many people come and how many people are not there. You serve Him. And if you serve him, you will do it with excellence, with energy, with eagerness. You know, in chapter 4, if you look at verse 5, where it says, But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. And then he ends that verse by saying, Fulfill, okay? Fulfill your ministry. What does that mean? It means to fill it up to the max. And the commentators said you can translate this as be eager. Be eager. Okay. Be eager to do all that's required of you and even more. Fulfill your ministry. Why? It's a charge. It's a solemn charge. Why? It's in the presence of God. He's not just watching. He's going to take you to court and dissect your heart and your effort and your work habit or whatnot. And, and you're going to be found guilty. And so work hard. Be eager to get this right. The rapture can happen at any moment and you will be standing before the Bema seat. And lastly, okay, It might 
uh, pertain to how you are used in the millennial kingdom. You will reign with Christ, but each person will be given a different type of responsibility in those 1,000 years. It will be based on how you've been faithful here on earth. Now, Paul, again, is trying to cause fear in the heart of Timothy. But the reason why Timothy is going to fear God at this moment is because he knows that the millennial kingdom is real. Do you, do you understand? Some of you do not take it seriously that it's to the glory of God to be used by Him. It brings great glory to God when you are excellent and do work for Him in a, in a, in a very, very blameless and an excellent manner. Meaning, it might just be that you're not a believer, because you don't really believe in the millennial kingdom, and you don't really care about the glory of Christ through your work. Because to you, in your mind, you're thinking, well, as long as I go to heaven, I'm fine. I'm totally fine with that. As long as I get to go, I'm fine. I just, you know, millennial kingdom, well, I guess it's, it's like, okay, fine. I guess it's going to happen, but I, I don't really picture myself, you know, eagerly wanting a big job in the millennial kingdom. So, you know, I, you know I, I'll just stay in my room in quarantine, in the cubic room world that we're going to be living in, that kind of an attitude is an attitude of someone who's not saved. Every time I mention the millennial, millennial kingdom, the rapture, if you are a true believer, it should cause you to get motivated to do greater things for God and repent from all the times you've grown hardened and, 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 and slow and sluggish and half-hearted with the work of God. So the real question is, you know, are you a true believer, right? Do you really believe Christ? Do you really believe that the Word says what it says? Then if so, then get your act together, be zealous, be eager, fulfill your ministry. And serve the Lord so that when he comes, you will not suffer loss. You will not be ashamed. But let's put it this way. A shame that he was not glorified through you. Does that make sense? It's not about you. We want to bring glory to Christ. We want to bring him honor. So I hope after today's message, you'll be eager to serve in the church. You'll be eager to do your work. You'll be eager to maintain whatever position you've been given to do and do it so excellently, whether or not people are watching because you want to be found blameless to His glory, that you might receive a reward, but that reward to His honor as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much. And we also confess to you our hearts and how foolish and how hardened we can become, how lazy and slothful, how misguided our intentions can be. Father, will you have mercy on us and, and receive our recommitment to doing what is excellent for you? Father, would you cause this the truth of your return, the, sol the solemnity of this, of this command to dig deep into our heart that we would walk in a very solemn manner, a holy manner, knowing that there is a holy fear, a, a judgment of God coming upon us for what we have done. Father, all at the same time, there is still this mixture of joy and happiness this relief that we can trust that your death on the cross satisfied the wrath of God, that we are not going to be held accountable for our sin. So help us, Lord, to live with this delicate balance between this tension of love of God, the joy in Christ, at the same time having a humble fear of God and the desire to be excellent with all that you have given to us. 
We pray that you would build your church through excellent workers. Would you build up your church? Build up the people here at Titus. Make us, Lord, excellent people of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.